Okay, World War I, Part Two, taking up directly where we left off. Point being, I don't want to really spend a lot of time on the Kaiser, although his personality is a factor here. Um, the existence of these armies led to, uh, well, let me back up a step. Uh, I'm not sure who started it. I think Germany started it. But once one country starts doing something like that, all its neighbors have to follow suit just in self-defense. Realize not everybody has, is uniquely positioned the way we are in the United States with uh, weak and generally friendly neighbors north and south and immense oceans east and west. Nobody's going to invade us, at least not with an army. Um, but if all you've got between you and the possibly hostile next door neighbor is like a river or something, you have to do the same. So um, by the second decade of the 20th century, several countries, Germany, France, Italy, I'm thinking probably Russia, uh, and notably not Britain, they, didn't, they just didn't pay any attention to it, uh, at a time when the German army contained over, I read somewhere and I can't find it again, over 80 combat divisions, infantry divisions. That's an immense army. The U.S. Army today is less than 10. The Brits had only about six. So these are huge armies, and uh, both Britain and both, uh, pardon me, Germany and France are planning in advance how they would wage war against the other. They just assume it's going to happen, and that leads to a sense of um, fatalism. That just these armies being there almost makes it inevitable that sooner or later they will be deployed against one another. Of course, no one has, I keep saying this, nobody had any idea how, how terrible a thing this was going to be for the arms race. Mostly that's uh, land armies, but Germany uh, challenged Britain to a naval arms race. So they were um, competing to see who could build the, uh, the biggest, fastest, and most heavily armed dreadnoughts. That's what they call battleships in those days. Uh, the word naught meant sometimes used as a synonym for zero. So it's a dreadnought because if you're aboard the world's most powerful ship, you have naught to dread. Okay, you know there's only one dreadnought left in the world of that type. It's the battleship USS Texas, which saw action in both world wars and uh, decommissioned after World War II, and they've got it down by Houston. Interesting ship. Okay, um, so you have that. So, uh, and... Um, think that's going to do that you you need to be sure that you read that portion of this so you have a high international tension you have a lot of frustrated nationalism you have intense intense nationalism on the part of the major powers of that era um, you have uh, armies that have been built up to outrageous strengths wartime strengths of course they got a lot bigger once the war did actually start so uh, it's, uh, it's a powder keg. Are you ready to light the fuse? Here we go. The immediate cause of the war. Okay. Uh, in southern Europe, north of Greece, there's a country called Serbia. It's back on the map again. After World War I was over, they created a new country called Yugoslavia, and Serbia was part of that. And then Yugoslavia broke up, I think, in the 1990s. Serbia's there again. Okay, and the, the Serbs had, the, had a country, but there are other Serbs that didn't live in Serbia. They lived in Bosnia, Herzegovina, places like that. I surely do need a map, and I don't have one. I believe the map was on page 446 of uh, your 8th edition textbook, regular textbook, not the supplements. So, um... um in about 1911 or 12, by the way, that part of the world going down through Greece, all of that, is, it is known as the Balkans, B-A-L-K-A-N-S, the Balkans. And uh, it's become a word, okay? If you have a situation where 
people are sort of divided up against each other, high tension, that sort of thing. It's said to have been balkanized. We Americans find ourselves having been balkanized by, I would say, people who have the goal of uh, uh, bringing us down and neutralizing us going forward in the world. I don't think that's a good thing. Well, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was trying to take over control of all this. Why a sane person would want to do that, I cannot explain, but they were. But there were a couple of Balkan wars. In one of those, the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is another one back on the map, had been taken over by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. All right, it's June 1914, and the crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, along with his wife and a sizable entourage, were touring the newly acquired province of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Okay, on the 28th of June, they reached the city of Sarajevo, <coughs> there were several events planned for them at various parts of the city. Now, also in town were a small number of, uh, let's say, terrorists. They were Serbs um, who wanted to add everywhere there were Serbs in, uh, onto Serbia. They weren't in Serbia. They'd come, they had come to town for the purpose of killing the Archduke, who was the uh, uh, crown prince. Oddly enough, if there was anybody in the royal family of that ungainly thing who was sympathetic to them at all, it would have been him. That didn't matter. So uh, the, the day is nearly done, and the uh, assassin gang are facing defeat. Nothing they tried had worked. They had two or three different plans. One of them had thrown a bomb at a motorcade. It missed the royal couple's car and hit another car, and killed and wounded some policemen. I uh, had another one with a gun who got practically close range to the Archduke and just chickened out. Just chickened out. <laughs> Wait a minute, what happens next if I do this? So it's about over and um, the uh, Archduke has <clears throat> reamed out the local officials, security not being good enough when he himself had asked that security be reduced so he could look accessible. Anyway, they've got one more place to go. And the, the chauffeur of their immense heavy touring car, it's open. They made a wrong turn. Uh-oh, this is not where I'm supposed to be. And if I'm correctly informed with automotive uh, technology in its infancy, the big open touring car did not have a reverse gear. So the only way to make it back up is to put it in neutral and get some really strong men to push it backward. Well, they're getting ready to do that, <clears throat> to push the car back and get it uh, to correct the course. When just standing there on this sidewalk a few feet away was a 19-year-old Serb named Gavrilo Princip. Had a pistol in his pocket, and he saw his chance, and he took it, stepped up on the running board and shot the Archduke and his wife. Apparently, this maybe it's a little bit unusual in royal marriages, these two may have really have been in love. If she dies quickly and he's pleading with her to stay alive, but he bled out too. They're both dead. One could almost say he pulled out a, uh, a pistol and um, killed 22 million people over the next few years. All right. So <clears throat> this is a tragedy, of course, but it could have been handled locally. This could have been a thing that would be handled between uh, Austro the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Bos or actually Serbia. They blamed Serbia because a Serb did it. Um, but that's where the alliances came in. Now, the month of uh, July 1914, <clears throat> there was a rising tensions uh, there was a series of uh, demands and ultimatums and <coughs> rebuttals flying back and forth between the capital cities <coughs> excuse me of uh, <coughs> Serbia <coughs> and uh, Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary in public they're outraged and they're in mourning behind closed doors. I suspect the high-level officials would have been slapping high fives if that had been invented yet because 
these Serbs have just given them a gold-plated invitation to annex Serbia. And now they've got their excuse. <coughs> anyway, as tensions rose, the, uh, the major powers began considering if you don't know what's going to happen, the first thing you'd have to do in a war is mobilize your army, okay? <coughs> Call up the reserves, uh, get the troops ready to, to uh, execute uh, assigned missions. <coughs> Mobilization is tantamount to a declaration of war, okay? Um, I'm not sure it was before or after what happened here, but Russia, Russia went first. Now, the Kaiser of Germany, the Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and King Edward the, okay, that's 1914, so many, King George V of Britain were all first cousins. <laughs> that's how it used to be. They were all grandsons of the English Queen Victoria, who had died some years earlier. And, um, uh, there's the, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going out of the way here just to tell you this, to kind of show you how it once was. Hasn't been since. Um, the Kaiser sent his cousin, the Tsar, a note advising him against mobilization, cautioning him, you know, we don't, we don't want, want to get this out of hand. We don't want to let this get out of hand, that sort of thing. But the funny part is it was addressed to Nikki and signed Willie. Wouldn't you think Nikki and Willie are a couple of 10-year-old boys deploying armies of toy soldiers on the parlor floor? Could have been. But in this case, Nikki and Willie were grown men. They were absolute monarchs. They were mobilizing armies of, of men numbering in the millions and armed with weapons far more destructive than any yet seen in the world. Nikki and Willie. Way to go. All right. About the end of July, the Austrians sent the Serbs a an ultimatum. That's a set of demands. If you don't say yes to this, there'll be a war. So in, deliberately, so um, insulting and demanding that they were hoping <laughs> the Serbs would reject it and then they could have the war. The Serbs, however, accepted all but two of the provisions, the demands, and said they would be willing to negotiate those. Well, Aust Austria just declared war anyway. And then the House of Cards began to fall. You'd almost have to have a map for this. Aust oh, wait, but before they did that, Austria-Hungary had uh, asked the Kaiser of Germany if, if he would back them up if they needed it. Now, sometimes good intentions go bad. He said yes, he would back them up. Now, the alliance they were in was defensive. They're not necessarily allied if they go on offense against somebody. They don't have that. But the Kaiser agreed to back them up. Now, that's what made the rest of it inevitable. He thought that with Germany's backing, Serbia would not even consider resisting this being annexed. But there was something else the Kaiser might not have known about. So Austria declares war on Serbia, and Serbia, I should have included this earlier, Serbia and Russia have had a thing going on for quite a while. If you mess with the Serbs, you are messing with the Russians. I don't know if it's a formal agreement or that's just how it is, but that's, that's not over. Russia then declared war on Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary is allied with Germany, so Germany declares war on Russia. Russia has this uh, entente thing with France, so France declared war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. Italy was supposed to have waded in on the side of Austria and Germany, but Italy reneged, stayed on the sidelines for two more years, and then joined the other side, while the British waited to see if anyone should um, violate the neutrality of Belgium. They did not have long to wait. We'll take it up in part three.